Now, when you set up, what time do we got, Dad? Okay, before 45? What time is it? It's at 5, 5 to 4. Okay. Okay. When you guys set up, here's something to think in mind. In the North Fork and some of those where you can get on both sides, uh, the lower section of the clear water, you can do that. What you'll have is if you have a, a bend in the river, and this is just going to be a very basic install, and this is why I used to walk in on the North Fork. I used to pack, the old man and I would go in there and pack in there and all this gear because I'm one of those idiots that's got to have everything but the kitchen sink. Packing everything. Here comes the guy in the orange coat. I had a big orange parka that I'd, I'd wear up in there and then take it off before I went down in there fishing. Why are you guys always walking and just drive up and park your truck? No, it's okay. I need the exercise. I'm fat. Whatever. I am, but here's why, guys. When, when these guys drive up in the road right here, in, in the, lower north, the lower clear water, you can get on both sides. You can do it down in the lower section. But here's what happens. These guys are fishing right here, okay? And say this is a good hole. Uh, there's a good depression in here that we know about, and we know the fish want to lay in this, okay? Here's what happens. The current's going this direction. These guys cast out. And they're doing everything they should. And what happens with that current is this. This is your bobber. It all had to happen, right? Your bobber gets pushed to the bank. Have you had that happen? So in order to not have that happen, these guys are constantly trying to put tension and they're, they're messing around with the float. Well, when I walk in here and I throw out here, what happens? It swings me down through the hole. Steel heading is all about how many times can I put it in that spot and swing it down through there. I don't know how I don't have a bladder infection because I'll be like, I gotta take a leak. And I'll throw and throw and the next thing two hours goes by and you're like, no, just one more cast. One more cast. It's all about how many repetitions can you get it through there. It is. That is the silly thing about steelhead. It's how many repetitions you get it through there. Well, if I get it out 10 times more than this guy, and I'm using the small stuff, and I'm using different scents, and then I throw on top of it that he's in the strike zone for 20 yards, and I'm in the strike zone for 80 yards, what happens? It's all about odds. Your odds go up. Your odds go up. And that's the North Fork, it happens like that. And there's some places on the South Fork that are like that too. Now, one of the things you need to keep in mind is that when, when the steelhead takes it, I see these, this, this whipping, these hook sets are incredible. Just the guy whoosh, up, the running up the bank, and there's a reel and he's falling, a boulder's that big, breaking your leg. I mean, we got no stretch line. We got the right rod, so we're not breaking our line. We've got the fluorocarbon. The fluorocarbon acts like a shock absorber. It's got some stretch to it. When you see that bobber go down, my rule is if we went out fishing today, I'd tell you guys, all right, what you're going to wait for is you're going to wait for tap, tap, sink. Tap, tap, sink before you set the hook. Here's why. If we've got a boulder, and this is underneath, and we're looking at a cross section of it like this. And our little jig is kind of like this, and he's, Seth told me I had to be eight to 10 inches off the bottom, and our jig is like this, and the jig is floating down like that, tink, tink as it's going down. What you'll see is it'll tap that rock, and as soon as that dude taps the rock, oh boy, that thing moved, and these guys are just, they're all over it. Don't do that, because you don't know if it's a rock or not, because you're down in the strike zone. What's gonna happen is this thing's gonna go tap, tap, and it's gonna roll around, it's going to, if I'm the rock, that jig's going to hit. It hits like this, and it just kind of rolls around, bounce, bounce, and then down around. What you're waiting for is it to go tap, tap, and sink. Here's the reason why. Now, you may set the hook after a tap, tap, sink, and it's a bottom. Fine. So you set the hook, and it was the bottom. If my steelhead, that's the ugliest steelhead I've ever seen. You see that? Can you guys believe that I was the art major? I don't know what I just did there. My wife's a drawer. Okay, so. This is the fish my, my daughter likes these kind of. Dad, I draw a fish. Okay, honey. Okay. These guys want to camp out behind these rocks because they're current breaks. And you don't know that's down there. You're letting your bobber tell you what's down there. As that little jig is bouncing, 
down through here, right? Bink, bink, says that it's going to roll around the rock. Well, as soon as it started tapping, you set the hook. Well, what you did is you went, oh, yeah, fly, and the jig went flying away from the fish. Okay? Here's what happens steelhead fishing. It's going down, do to do tap, tap, tap. I open my mouth. The jig falls in it because I was yawning. The line comes back. The bobber's pulling, pulling, and the bobber goes under. That fish isn't moving. He opened his mouth, took the product in. It went in. It's going to hook him on the corner of the mouth, like so. It's going to pull tension because he's not going anywhere. Then your bobber's going to go down. Then you set the hook. It could have been that you rolled around the rock and it got caught in moss, which can happen up there. There's a lot of moss in that rock. Or you got wedged, whatever. But it tap tapped around and you let it go and then all of a sudden it came in here and this guy here might have went tap tap because he was swimming, but that bobber's always going to swing and as soon as it gets tension in his mouth, it goes under. When it goes down, you set the hook. So many times I've seen guys do that that I've taken down and as soon as that thing starts jumping around, they're jerking on it. I was a bite! It's only a bite if the float goes down. 100% guarantee you, when the float goes down, it's a fish. When you're side drifting, and side drifting is a hard thing for guys to get into. Because you're feeling the rocks. Well, you're going, and then there's nothing. And it just kind of gets heavy. You better set the hook. Because one has grabbed it, you floated by, you're not feeling the bottom because your weight's kicked out, and there's tension there. Just like bass fishing, you feel a thump, and then it starts to move and there's tension. Same thing with your float. Let it tap, tap, fine. Until it sinks, don't do nothing. Now what's going to cause the hookups to be even better, you've got to use barbless hooks down there, right? Buddy of mine hates it. They're there for a reason to keep them on. He just hates it. Okay? Ultra sharp hooks. Whether you use a uh, file to manually do it or you use a, one of those Berkeley tools, they're awesome. <laughs> Done. When you take that jig, I don't know if any of these ones have been sharpened yet. No, these ones haven't been fished. But when you take a jig, and you can see how that doesn't want to stick, when that thing is sharp, you'll touch it there and it won't come off. That's when it's sharp and ready to fish. So that when it comes down, boppity bop, and hits and pulls, that tension, just from that thing being sharp and the tension of that bobber, it's going to put that in there just enough so when you set the hook, you've got it. Ultra sharp hooks. Ultra sharp hooks. Now, as you're tap, tap, tapping around on the bottom all day long, what's going to happen to your hook point? It's going to get a little crummy. Sharpen it up. You'll find a, a box of the dead, I call it. And inside that box of the dead is any jig head that's had a chip in it. And if there's a little chip in that, it's off. It goes in the box of the dead to be painted later. I will not fish it if there's lead showing. Because it don't look natural. If you chip a jig, take it off. Take the time. Put another one on. Very important. You go fishing with me, guys, and I am so super anal about things. It's like I'm obsessive compulsive when it comes to fishing. Everything has to be a certain way, done a certain way. It has to look a certain way. But it's that type of thought process that'll make you catch fish. Going, well, that's not a big deal. It's just got a little paint chipped out of it. I've done it enough times to see that, yeah, that's a big deal. It's a big deal. Their eyesight's very keen, and it doesn't look right. Okay. Time we got, Pops. How much time? 15 left? Okay, what we'll do, guys, with 15 left, we'll do questions for the next 15. So go ahead and fire anything you want. Yes? You're fixing those <clears throat> different pools and stuff on the clear water. Right. You know, if you go out, like, ask and stuff, the guide boats, you know, hire a guide. Right. They'll drift them with the side drift the eggs two or three times. And you might pull two or three fish. They'll drift it one or two more times, and then they take off. Right. So have they have they changed up a corky color? You basically say there's still fish in there. There's still fish in there. And what will happen, guys, you, you see it happen, and I see this, I don't know, you guys know who Jim Teeny is, the fly guy? Fly guys hate my guts, I'm sorry. but Jim Teeny, and we do this on the South Fork. You'll have a big dark seam right there, and you know there's fish in it. You take and throw a rock in there or you run a big old heavy uh, slinky weight down through there, what it does is it drives them out. <coughs> drives them out of there and they slide up and then it exposes them. You see them in there. Jim Teeny's famous for doing it. Okay? You'll just drive them, just corral them right out of that hole. They're not running upstream, they just go, they're sliding away from that tension, that pressure. 
Well, you go through on a guide boat with six guys, and you got all those lines bouncing down through there, and this is the seam they're on, the seam they're on. Well, what happens? They've corralled those fish, and they've pushed them off. So it's easier for those guys because they got to tie everything, switch it up. Let's just buzz up to the next hole because they're in a boat, plant it, and start working these fish. They can come back to those fish in an hour and be back on them again in that seam. When you're standing on the bank, you don't have a boat, you just keep changing up. And you'll continue to keep catching the fish. Other questions, guys? I know I'm not that good. Come on. How did I get to be so good looking? Come on, we got any of it. Do you ever fish that kind of rig in the Deschutes River? You know, I have not fished in the Deschutes. Um, that is a place I don't know much about. Uh, the people that I do know that fish it, they fish a lot of spoons there. More so than, than anything anywhere else that far up. Uh, spoon fishery. We got a lot of guys that use our planter boards and plugs, back trolling off the bank like that. Uh, but I know that steelhead, any place I've ever fished, whether it's in Canada or down here, they'll eat a jig. They'll eat a jig. I don't care where it's at or what time of year, they'll all eat a jig. Those fish down there, you got to think about the Deschutes fish, they're coming in earlier, they're brighter, they haven't traveled as far up the Columbia as our fish. So that's why the spoon fishery is, is more popular there because when you swing a spoon down through, they, they crush it. They're charging out to grab it. You're not really, you're swinging it in front of them, but they're, they're coming at it to attack. You're not just slipping it to them. So I would, I would tell you with 100% efficiency that you could catch them like that. I would. You know. Yes, sir? When you put the uh, foil on there, do you use a, a spray and then do you do it fairly lightly on there? Yeah, the, the key with that, I'm glad you brought it up because I just skipped over that. Okay, guys, here's something to keep in mind with this stuff. <sighs> what I do with this, and now you've got different kinds of hackle, and we, let's cover this really briefly. Um, you've got mirabu. Marabou, marabou, okay. You've got moose hair. You've got, uh, there's a marabou there. This one here is marabou. Um, I thought I grabbed one. Where's it at? Oh, here it is. This is bucktail, okay. These fibers here, a lot more rigid, correct? You could take this out if you wanted to and go <laughs> and spray that stuff all over, okay, because these are more rigid. But with this guy right here, what you want to do here, because this mirabu, if you put some oil on that and throw it in the water, it just, it's just stuck to itself. You want this stuff to breathe, and that's the reason why these small ones work so much better than the big ones. As that big one's floating down through there, it's all rigid. Where this one, as it's floating down through that stuff, see how I just, the, wind, the air moving it? It's just going, whoosh. okay? You want it to breathe. So the key to that is, hold it this direction here. Take your nozzle, and you're not going to spray. All you're going to do is just depress it till a drop runs out, and you just put it right on the head because you don't want all that stuff all over that back end. It's going to take the action away from it. If you do happen, and it does happen, if it leaks back on the cast or whatever, and you're bringing it in, you're seeing it all matted, just throw it in a separate section of your box. When you get home, take some non-ultra lemon dish detergent and just put some on your fingers, get it wet, hot water, and just kind of real gently go like this, and that uh, detergent will pull that oil off of there. But don't spray it all over with this marabou like this because it's just going to collapse those down. You want them to breathe, okay? Uh, 